Amen. You guys appreciate Pastor Kurt. He's a blessing, isn't he? Listen, I am so excited to be here. Uh, I didn't even bring my iPad. I wasn't ready to preach. I'm up here for a series of meetings. I actually get to help uh, coach church planners uh, around the country, and I was up here for some meetings for that. And uh, I was going to fly out tonight originally, and then I decided to stay an extra day. So I'm real excited to be with you guys. It's an incredible privilege uh, to be here. Uh, as Kurt said, I'm the lead pastor of Life Mission Church in Kansas City. We actually have two campuses getting ready to start our third. Uh, very excited about that. Uh, and uh, I love Res Life. I love this church. Uh, I was a youth pastor uh, for 13 years uh, in two different cities, in Kansas City and then also up here. I was in Kalamazoo at one of the Res Life Church plants down there. It's now called Radiant. And, uh, and then I planted uh, Life Church. It was called Life Church. We changed it to Life Mission Church uh, in my hometown, which is just incredible to plant a church in your hometown, where I went to high school, where I got kicked out of high school, where all that stuff, and uh, get to just really honor Jesus in your hometown. And since then, God's blessed our church in amazing ways. I've had the privilege of... Um, baptizing some of my high school buddies, guys I played football with, guys that beat me up. I actually baptized a guy who beat me up in junior high. How cool is that? I thought about holding him down, you know, but um, <laughs> anyway, um, and i uh, done weddings. I've unfortunately done a few funerals of people I grew up with as well. Uh, but it's an incredible privilege to be able to, uh, to honor Jesus. I love it. I, I bring greetings uh, from my family, uh, my beautiful bride, Mary. Uh, we're getting ready to celebrate our 28th wedding anniversary. Can you believe that? <laughs> Yes, I was 10 when I got married. Um, no, I'm just kidding. And, uh, and we have six kids. Matter of fact, I think we have a picture of my family. You got that picture right there? Am I a rich man or what? Look at that. Uh, it's my beautiful bride, Mary. I have two daughters there on the left, on your right, your left. Um, they're both in college. Can't believe I'm old enough to have college kids. Uh, my oldest uh, is working on her, uh, her degree at the King's University. She's on staff at New Life Church in Colorado Springs. And then my second daughter there, she's 20. This picture's a couple of years old. I need to get a new one. Uh, she is in Morocco right now uh, on a missions trip. She actually is a part of an internship program. And uh, she's been over there since December 15th, so she missed Christmas. And here's the amazing thing. You know, Morocco is not a real open nation to the gospel. And we're real plugged in there. we got some missionaries we support there, things like that. And uh, the missionary that's there that she's working with, um, they've had one conversion, one person give their faith, their hearts to Jesus in the last two years. It's hard soil, okay? It's not like going to Honduras, all right? It's, it's rough soil. And, uh, but just last week, my daughter and one of her buddies led two girls to the Lord in Morocco. Isn't that cool? Love it, love it, love it. And then my son, who here is 12 and tiny, is now 14, and he's almost as tall as me, 150 pounds. Uh, Allie is 11. And then you see the two kids that look just like me, right? That's Justice and Hannah. I'm going to talk about them a little bit more. Uh, we adopted them. But before I get to that, let me just pray, and we'll jump into this. Is that good? Father, I thank you today that you're here. Lord, I thank you that you love us more than we can possibly imagine. God, I thank you that you want to speak to us today. You don't have to love us. You don't have to be interested in us. And yet, Scripture says that you're attentive to our prayers. And so today, as you listen to this prayer, God, I pray that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive what you want to say. God, I pray that Thank you for that. each one that's here today, each individual that's here, that you know us, not just by name or reputation. You don't just know what we've accomplished or our failures. Lord, you know our heart, you know our hurts, you know our needs, and you know what we need to hear today. So I invite your Holy Spirit to come and to speak to hearts in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. As Kurt said, I talked to him on the phone, and he called me pretty quick right after I got off the plane and asked me to speak, and, and I was excited about it. And as he told me what you guys have been talking about in Galatians and in Ephesians, uh, I knew exactly what I want to talk about. I want to talk to you tonight about what I call the power of adoption. You know, adoption is an interesting word, uh, and it's not a word that we think about a whole lot. It's not a word that means a lot to most of us unless you've been affected by it, unless you were adopted or you have someone in your family that's adopted. That's one of those words that's for others. It's one of those words that affects other people but not us, and yet it's in the Bible. And it's a bigger word than I think most of us realize. And not only can it have an incredible impact on us uh, as God's kids, it has to. 
We have to get it. We have to understand the power of adoption because it's so key to our identity as who we are as the children of God. I think most of us miss it. Galatians 4, I know you guys studied it. Uh, I want to go back to it today. It says this in Galatians 4, 5. It says, God sent him, talking about Jesus, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. All of us have been slaves to the law. Now, that sounds kind of weird when you read the text, and it says slaves to the law. You think, well, I've never been slave to the law. I was slave to rebellion. This is talking about the law of God, but really what it's talking about is that we were slaves to sin. We were slaves to the reality that we are lost without a Savior. And Scripture says that God sent his son Jesus to, to, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Why did God send Jesus what does the scripture say right there? Why did God send Jesus? Come and help me out. You guys got to talk to someone. What's the scripture say? Why did God send Jesus? To buy freedom, right? Come on now. Pay attention. It's right there in the text. This is a college group. It's not elementary school, right? Why? You say, well, I think the, I think the kindergartners would have got that. Uh, it says, God sent his, him, Jesus, to do what? To buy what? To buy freedom. But why did he send Jesus to buy freedom? We get that. We understand that. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But why did he send him to buy our freedom? So that he could adopt us. You know, a lot of times as believers, we focus on the freedom part. Freedom from our past, freedom from our pain, freedom from our sin. And that is so vital. But what we have to catch is that there's a so that. That there was more to the agenda of God than just our freedom. There was more to the plan of God than us just being forgiven of our sin and us being free from the things that used to hold us in captivity, which is huge. And when you hear my story a little bit later, you'll know that I speak from experience. But we've got to catch the fact that it was more than just freedom from, that it was the invitation to. That it was more than what God was going to deliver us from. It was what he was inviting us to become a part of. That he invites us into his family. That he adopts us as his very own. No matter where we've been, no matter what we've uh, done, no matter what our family history is, he invites us into his family. But to the extent that we're willing to receive that and believe that and embrace that is to the level that we can begin to experience the plan that God has for every one of us. Matter of fact, let's keep reading here. Verse 6 says, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call it Abba Father. Now, you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, he has made you an heir. Listen, adoption is a powerful word. Everybody say adoption. adoption. Now listen, if you don't get anything else tonight, I want you to get this. There's lots of definitions for adoption. You can look it up in the Greek here. You can look it up in Webster's Dictionary. But I want to give you a very simple uh, definition tonight. And if you don't get anything else, I want you to get this. Adoption means receiving a new identity. No matter what your identity was before, when we're adopted into the family of God, our identity changes. For me, uh, I, my identity before Christ was I was rebellious. My identity before Christ is I was violent. My identity before Christ is I was selfish. My identity before Christ is I was the son of a, of a convict. My dad was in out of prison half my life. My identity was that I was, um, I, my mother was a teenager when I was born. I was an accident. I was conceived in the back of a pickup truck. Uh, by two teenagers who met at a skating rink. Those were things that tried to identify me. And, and, and those things stayed with me uh, until I was adopted into the family of God. And all those th although those things continue to be true, they're not nearly as true as my new identity in Christ. Amen? And so the scripture says those who are in Christ are a new creation. All things pass away. He makes all things new. And so our adoption is so huge. No matter what our background is, when we begin to embrace our new identity, everything changes. So I want you to get this. I'm going to say several times in my message, I'm just going to pop them up in the middle of nowhere. I'll be preaching whatever. And then I'm going to say this, adoption means, and I want you to finish the sentence. So adoption means, and here's what it means, receiving. Everybody say receiving. receiving. A new identity. Now say it all together, receiving a new identity. One more, one more time, receiving a new identity. Can you guys do that? Can we handle that? Let's try it again. Receiving a new identity. One more time, receiving a new identity. You guys getting that? When you get a new identity, everything changes. 
Receiving a new identity is not just about a name change. It's not about a career change. It's not about a geographical change. It's about a heart change. And that's what happens when we come to faith is that God does a renovation of the heart. He begins to change us from the inside. And the things that used to identify us, the things that used to, we used to be known by, the things that used to try to hold us captive, no more have control over us because we have received a new identity. Adoption means? Come on, you can do this. Adoption means? I know it's a little clumsy. I tried to simplify it. But you can get this. If you don't get anything else, I want you to get the fact that adoption means. I'm going to talk to you tonight what it means to receive a new identity. You know, it's interesting. I've been following Jesus. In this coming May, it'll be 30 years since I came to faith as a rebellious, young, 17-year-old kid. And I'll tell a little bit more of my story later. But I've been following Jesus for 30 years And I look back at what God's done in my life and the journey that I've been able to be on, and it's been an amazing thing. But something happened several years ago that has really began to even amplify the power of adoption and the power of my new identity in ways I never really would have thought. You know, after I graduated from Bible college and I got involved in youth ministry and I worked with teenagers for 13 years, several of those years working with at-risk kids and things like that, I I thought I had a pretty good grasp on the Father heart of God. I thought I had a pretty good grasp on what it meant to be a child of God. And then uh, my wife and I, we had been involved in uh, missions for years and gone overseas and worked with orphanages and, and, uh, and our church supports orphanages and we had a heart for that. And, uh, and my wife reminded me, she went to India on a mission trip and she came back and she reminded me of a, of a conversation, really more of a conversation, a prayer that we prayed in our early 20s when we were still in college. And she reminded me that we had talked about adoption. You see, in the early days of our marriage, we, uh, we had a miscarriage, and then we had another miscarriage, and, and the doctors, and the second miscarriage that we had, my wife was pretty far along, and, and they told us they didn't know that she was going to be able to carry to term, and, and so we kind of came to terms with that, and we thought, well, maybe we're just going to, maybe we're not going to be able to have kids of our own, we're going to adopt, and so we, we kind of made a vow, we didn't really make a vow, but we kind of did, we said, God, you know, if it be your will, we would love to adopt someday, so then you fast forward years later, and we hit 40, and, uh, and we've got, all, we have 40 four kids and we got a church that we're doing, all these different things are going on. And my wife goes to India, she's working with orphans and she comes back and she says, you know, I believe God spoke to me that it's time for us to adopt. And it was really crazy because the same week that God spoke to her while she was in India, I was in the middle of a a series at church and I was talking about family and I had my daughter who's now 22 and works in uh, in youth ministry at a church. At that time, she was a teenager. She partnered with me in my message and we preached together. And I'll never forget, we have a Saturday night service. On Saturday night, we were planning on about being 50-50. I was gonna open, she was gonna share some, I was gonna preach some, she's gonna share some more. And I was kind of, you know, stabilizing the message, and then I was going to close. And uh, on Saturday night, I realized this is really her sermon. I just need to stay out of her way. You know what I'm saying? And um, as I'm watching her preach on Sunday morning, it was obvious to me, the, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that he wanted to add to our family. And I hadn't thought about adoption necessarily, but when my wife got back, we knew it was God. So we went on this journey of adoption. Now we, as a church, we support three orphanages in India. One of them is the uh, children of lepers, which I know seems crazy. It seems like a Bible thing. And you think, is that really today? Yes, in India, they still do with leprosy. We have another uh, um, uh, orphanage there that we just are ministering to street kids in India. And then in Africa, uh, we have three orphanages that our church supports as well. And one of them is the children of AIDS victims. And, and, uh, and so we begin to pray and ask the Lord, you know, what do you want us to do? Uh, where do you want us to adopt from? And one of our good friends, Derek Anderson, who's a worship pastor at New Life, he was getting ready to adopt from Haiti and some of our friends that adopted from China were praying. And uh, it was just crazy how God, one thing after night, I need to not get into the crazy details of the story. One thing led another, we found, we realized that God wanted us to adopt from Ethiopia. And Ethiopia, there was an orphanage there that we supported. And so we started the process and we were praying and there's a lot of details that go into that. But uh, as we were going through that, God made it really clear. And then he dropped a huge bombshell because he spoke to my wife again. He seems to talk to her more than me. I don't know why that <laughs> happens. But uh, anyway, that we were going to adopt two. And uh, I was like, are you crazy? Okay. And, uh, but we ended up adopting two kids from Ethiopia. And uh, we have a picture of them the day that we got them. This is what's called your gotcha day. And uh, so that's Justice, and that's little Hana, and now they're almost six and seven years of age. But we got them when they were really young. And, and, uh, you know, you look at them, and uh, little Hana, she was found uh, the day 
uh, that she was born in a knapsack. Placenta was still connected to her. Uh, they had no idea where she'd come from. A goat farmer found her. And uh, we don't know anything about her mother. Nobody has any idea, any details about uh, Justice, on the other hand. Um, and by the way, they had different names at the time. We, we believe God gave us the names for them. And when we adopted them, we gave them new names. Uh, but Justice, um, he went through a lot of trauma before we got him. And you look at that little guy and you say, man, he didn't even live long enough to go through trauma. But the records actually show that he was abandoned multiple times. And then the, the officers found him, the local people would find him, and they'd take him back to his mother, and then they would find him again. And this went on several times, and then eventually his mother disappeared, and he got bounced around the system for several months. And when we got him, he was emotionally shut down. We couldn't get him, you kind of see how he's looking off. We couldn't get him to look at us. Uh, we couldn't get him to embrace in any way, uh, really anything, uh, you know, and, and he was, uh, his body was traumatized. His intestines were a disaster. He had giardia and all kinds of issues in his, in his bowels, and his, his hips were messed up because he had sat so long, um, and he had had lots of, you know, bites on him and things like this, and so he didn't walk very good. He walked real bull-legged, and so when we first got him, my older son, who's a total athlete, was a little disappointed because he was hoping to have a, you know, a son he could beat on, or a brother he could beat on, stuff like that. The crazy thing is now this kid uh, runs like the wind, okay? It, it's amazing the change that's happened in him. He is always the fastest kid. I was telling Kurt when we got together before tonight, uh, he plays soccer uh, this last fall, and, and he played on a team, and, and uh, just, you know, he's only six years old, and we, we played him up because last year we learned our lesson. He, in, in seven games, scored 48 goals. <laughs> yeah, just nuts, and I, and and the other parents are getting mad because he steals the ball and then goes and scores and, um, from his own team. And, um, <laughs> and so, so this year, we played him up, you know, with older kids. And, he, he's, and it's just crazy. And I watch that. And I just think I meant to have a picture of that because it's just so fun to look at. But the, the reason I share all that, and I better get to my message because I'm still on page one. I have several. Is um, uh, <laughs> These kids th that you just saw, their identities have changed. And listen, when their identities changed, everything changed. I'll never forget getting on that plane and flying home and, you know, all the trauma that went with that and all the things that we went through. And I'll tell a little bit more of that. Well, I'll just tell you right now, Justice, he could not sleep for more than an hour or two. He would wake up in a panic attack and, and just scream. And he did this, he could never go more than an hour or two at a time. And he would fill his diaper every time, and he, it was acidic. And I know that's gross, but I'm just telling you, he was a mess inside, and he was a mess outside. And during that time, uh, we had two, okay? And we got him home, and when we got him home, my wife, who was a point guard in high school and athletic and runs 10Ks and 13.1s and all those things, Mrs. Athlete herself, uh, we, we have these kids, and we go on our first walk with them, and she rolls her ankle and breaks her foot. And so we have two new babies in our home, and we have six kids total, two teenagers in high school, and we have these two kids that adopted, and uh, my wife can't walk. And so I told my staff, I'll see you in a couple of months, you know, and, and I was home, and, uh, but Justice wouldn't sleep, and, uh, and so what happened was we just divided and conquered, and I got Justice, and she got Hannah, and, and literally every couple of hours, I would hold him, and he would fight me, and he'd stick his fingers into my eyes and scream, and he was detached, and he wouldn't look at me, and the whole goal was just to get him to attach to us and to draw, and so I would just have to kind of bear hug him gently and let him fight until he would get so sweaty he would finally just fall asleep and then I'd, I'd lay him down and then about an hour or two later he'd wake up and do the same thing again and I began to just pray I began to just you know uh, just break the bondages of an orphan spirit over him I began to speak the word of God of my praying the spirit over him and during that time what I didn't realize was how much God was breaking me and how much God was dealing with me and revealing to me the heart of the father 
And there was never a moment, I got to tell you, and I don't say this to sound noble or, or wonderful, or, but the reality is we were so vested that he was our son that I never once had the thought that I should take him back. I, I mean, I never once had the thought, I'm, I can't do this. I never once had the, I mean, there were nights that I, you know, thought about giving him some cough medicine so he'd sleep a little longer, but I never once had the thought of quitting on him. No matter how many messes he made, no matter how many times he woke me up, no matter how many times he messed up my schedule, I never had that thought because we had adopted him. He, he carries my name. In Ethiopia, it's culture, it's tradition that a son will have a name, and then literally their last name is their father's first name. That sounds so weird to us, doesn't it? And so if we were in Ethiopia, his name would be Justice Clinton, and that would be it. That's a weird thing, isn't it? But that's the culture that's there. So we did the same thing. His name is Justice Clinton Sprague. So he carries my name. And so I'm, I never once had the thought of giving up on him. And I want you to hear today that when we're adopted into the family of God, God never once even considers giving up on you. No matter how many messes you make, no matter how many times you fail, no matter how many times you mess up the schedule, God, when we become his children, he is all in with us. He has demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, while we were making messes, Christ died for us. Amen. And we've got to get that and understand that and able to be able, in order to be able to run the race that God has for us. So their whole identity changed when they became our children. Look back at Romans 8 with me. It says this, verse 15. It says, For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And as we went through the adoption process, God began to really reveal to me the power of our adoption as God's people as we walk through that physical adoption. When we're born again, we're adopted by him. And adoption means receiving a new identity. You guys aren't the slowest, but you know, you're catching up. Adoption means... And let me tell you, receiving a new identity is a game changer. It changes everything. To better understand adoption into God's family, let's take a look at what Paul was talking about. When Paul talks about adoption, the culture in Rome at that time, there was an adoption culture. In that culture, it was not uncommon for adults in their late 20s and 30s and 40s to die. As a matter of fact, it was common. And so actually the orphan rate in that culture was much higher than it is in our culture. We don't really think about that so much, but because of the increase of technology and the incredible uh, advancements in medicine, we live longer. And, and so what happens is people that are of childbearing age live through those years and they live to tell about it and raise their kids. In the culture that Paul was talking to, it was not uncommon for people who had a, a quiver of kids to die. And so uh, adoption was part of the culture. And so when Paul says this in Romans to the church in Rome, adoption was an obvious illustration that everybody would get. And what's interesting about adoptions in Rome was under Roman law, certain things took place when someone was adopted, similar to adoptions today, but even stronger. Uh, when, when someone was adopted, their old life as a child was wiped out. Now, much more than today. In other words, I, as much as I know about our kids, they're going to know. Now, I don't know a lot, but what I know, I told you a little, and of course, I know, I know more details than that, and I have every intention of taking both of them back to Ethiopia individually and, and, and showing them where we got them and taking, well, because that's going to bring closure, that's going to bring some strength to their journey. But in the Roman culture, they never did that. As soon as an adoption happened, they sealed the history and it was never to be talked about again. Adoption was final. Part of that was because of the honor culture and because they wanted that child to embrace their new identity. Now, there's some important things we can learn in that. that that's what God calls us to do when we embrace our adoption into his family. The second thing under Roman law was that this new adopted child was regarded as a new person, his past was released, including his debts. 
If there were any deaths from his family tree, if there were any penalties, if there was any shame on that family, if they were uh, from what we might call a lower class or a lower caste, that was erased. Now they are officially a part of this new family and adoption was legally binded. The adopted family uh, a child was considered a full and complete son of the, of the family and could be the heir of that. And so it meant a totally new identity, which means that the same things are true in our identity. When we're adopted into his family, we gain all the rights of being child of God, children of God. The sins of our past are wiped away, and our adoption to God's family is legally binding. we got to get that, you guys. So let me just say, God is for you, and we got to understand that he chooses to adopt us into his family. Look back at Ephesians verse one. I love it in the Message Bible. It says, long before he laid down the earth's foundations, he had us in mind. And he settled on us as the focus of his love. To be made, to be made whole and holy. Long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. You know, it's interesting when we were preparing to adopt all four of my older kids, you know, my two daughters were teenagers at the time. And then we had the two, what we call, we call them the girls, the middles, and the littles. And the, the four that we had were so excited about the littles. And, you know, my son was buying, you know, Royals jerseys and Jayhawk jerseys. And he was all ready to have a little brother. And, and my, my daughter, who's now 11, was in princess mode. And she's going to have a little doll to play with, you know, as a sister. And they were in that prep mode. And my wife and I were preparing. And I remember as we got ready to go get, we, there was such joy that we took in the idea that we were going to bring them into our family. And scripture says that's the heart of the Father as well. But if I look at 1 Corinthians 2, it says, But it is written, No eye has seen nor has heard, ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And the idea that when, when those babies were sitting in that orphanage, Justice especially, the orphanage that he was in, there were a couple of dozen kids in that room. It was more of a state-run orphanage, whereas Hannah was in a Christian orphanage, and she was cared for with a lot of compassion. Justice was just a number, and he was in full survival mode. And uh, when he was in that orphanage, in that place, I remember when I went to see it. He hadn't been there for a little while, but we got to go and see where he had been. I was so grieved that he had spent so much time there. And you think about where he was and the fact there was no window for him to even look out. And, 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 and there were just a few workers there. And, and, and the idea, even though in that young little mind, mind, he had no idea what was coming. He had no way of even fathoming the yard that he has now and, and the, the three basketball goals that we have, one in the driveway and two in the basement and, and the brothers and sisters that he would have and, and, and the playground that's just right around the corner and the pool that that's in our neighborhood and all the, he had no way of even conceiving. That was such a fan. Of, he wouldn't even have been able to dream that. And yet we were dreaming it. And scripture says that is what it's like for us. We cannot even begin to conceive what God has prepared for us as his people and the heart that he has to invite us into his family. And so we've got to begin to catch the fact that adoption means receiving. And that's a game changer. It changes everything. And so I have already taken way too long to get to the message. So you guys ready to get started? Here we go. I'm just kidding. I want to give you three things today right out of Romans 8. And I want you to catch these things today because these are what it takes for us to receive. we got to understand this that we're going to receive our adoption as his kids. And let me just say right out of the gate, I believe that many believers, many Christians, many people that are in church live like orphans. Do you know that my son, Justice, although he bears my name and he's fully a son legally and in every other way, it only really is fulfilled when he embraces that reality. And one of the things that we learned as we were preparing to adopt was the power of attachment and the incredibly traumatic effects of detachment. And he had never attached to anyone. When you're a little baby and you cry and your mother comes to you and comforts you and feeds you and takes care of you, there's a bonding that happens that he never got to have. 
When you experience pain or fear or discomfort and your parent comes and comforts you, there's an attachment that comes that he never got to have. And so we had to be very intentional about taking him back there and then proving to him we will not leave so that he could attach to us. And I think many times as Christians, what happens is we've been born again and we've been brought into the family of God, but many times our default is to continue to live like orphans, to continue to live like those that are not a part of the family of God. And so I want to give you today what I call the traits of an adopted child of God. Look back at Romans 8, 15. It says, for you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received a spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The first thing I want to give you today is that the adopted are not in bondage to fear. Orphans live in constant fear. As I went, I went on a mission trip a year after we adopted back to Ethiopia, took a team there, and, uh, and, and we retraced the steps a little bit where, where justice had been found. And as I just kind of saw the landscape of that region, and I thought about where he had come from. And then I thought about what I had been told about him and thought about him as a little baby being abandoned and not knowing who to trust. I think many people go through life like that. We don't know who to trust. We live in fear. And fear can keep people in captivity. Fear of rejection, fear of pain, fear of failure, fear of death. Scripture says in 2 Timothy 1, it says, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. You will only walk in power and love and a sound mind when you embrace the reality that you've been adopted in the family of God, that you are his son, that you are his daughter, no matter what your family tree, no matter what your history is. There is there's a peace that surpasses understanding when we know not just who we are, but whose we are. Adopted children of God know who they are and whose they are. Adoption means? Now you guys got to come to Life Mission so we can get you tuned up. Come on. I tell my church all the time, I say, church is not a spectator sport. It's participatory. I need your help. Adoption means? Second thing the adopted that really defines the adopted is that the adopted know Father God as Abba. You know, the word Abba is interesting. It only shows up in Scripture three times. And all three times, it's incredibly powerful. You know, there's usually two words in every language. This is interesting. All throughout the world, in most cultures, there's two terms that are used for father. There's a formal word, and there's an informal word. There's a, there's a legal word, and then there's a relational word. And so, like, in our culture, we would say father, and we would say Daddy, even as a worship leader, I don't know his name, but as he as I talked about that during worship, I was like, did he look at my notes? Because the reality is we are invited into the family of God. There's a legal aspect to that. That's, that we are adopted because Jesus paid the price for our adoption. But there's also the relational side that we get to call him daddy, that we get to know him at that level. And, and, and I remember when I was nine years old, uh, my dad had just gotten out of prison. Uh, he'd been in, in jail for a few, actually at that time he wasn't in prison, he was just in jail. He went to prison a little later. But he had been in jail and, 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 and he had gotten out and, and, and he was getting his life together. And he was trying to make it work and all this type of stuff and I was hanging out with him. And I'll never forget, we were at his, at his parents' house, my grandparents, and, um, and we were leaving the house and as we were leaving the house, uh, I, I realized that he and my grandfather had been arguing. And I'd been with my grandmother, and they'd been fighting. And then he said, come on, let's go. And so we walk out the door. And as we walk out the door, he's kind of trucking along pretty fast. And so I'm following him. And as I'm following him, I said, Daddy. Okay? And the reason I said, Daddy, I have no idea. I'm sure I was asking for something. What's a nine-year-old kid do? They ask, you know, we're going to get candy. We're going to do this. And I said the word, Daddy. And when I said the word, Daddy, my dad turned around and backhanded me right across the face. And he said this to me, he said, Daddy, don't call me Daddy. And then he used a, a, a cuss word that I won't use today and, uh, and, and, and said, you know, basically only wimps would use Daddy. Call me Dad. And you know, I learned a powerful lesson that day. Don't call him Daddy. And I never call him Daddy again. I learned that lesson. My dad was an abuser. There's a lot of stories I could tell. I don't have time today to do that. But I learned a lesson that day. And that lesson that I learned 
almost 30 years ago, would love to identify me today. It would love to hold me captive. It would love to keep me in a macho mentality. It would love to keep me in a performance orientation. It would love to keep me in an attitude that says, i got to measure up. i got to take care of myself. All those, those things try to get on me. We learn lessons in life many times that though they feel real, they are lies from the pit of hell. And so I, I inherited an orphan spirit that day. That was the beginning of, of the enemy work in my life. And many of us have father wounds that hinder our ability to relate to God as a loving father. And until we allow God to take us back and heal our wounds, we'll never enjoy real freedom. The freedom that comes from our adoption because adoption means... And so to, pa, pa, Paul was telling them in Romans that we can call the God of all creation daddy and that he likes it. He's not going to backhand us and say, I am your heavenly father. He's not going to do that. He loves it when we know him as daddy. He loves it when we know him at that level. Now, dead religion put wall, puts walls between us and God and tells us we have to perform to be accepted by God. But scripture says far different. Ephesians 2 says, he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near. And through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You know, there's nothing more powerful than kids knowing that they have full access to their kids. And I love it when my 22-year-old daughter who's in Bible college and is a junior high youth pastor, I love it when she calls me to just vent or to share her frustrations because it reminds me that though she's, you know, eight-hour drive away, her heart's still with me. I love the fact that when the Royals were winning the World Series, did you guys notice that that happened? I don't Do you guys have a baseball team here in, in Michigan? Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm just... I almost wore my shirt. I left it home. Anyway, my daughter, my Nicole, who's 20, she is so my daughter that while she was gone uh, at, at the internship in Colorado, preparing to go on a mission trip, when the Royals were in the process of dominating, and uh, stop that, and um, she's been so trained by her daddy, been raised up in the way that she should go, so when she gets old, she won't depart from it, that... <laughs> The internship that she was a part of, check this out, they didn't have TV, you can't watch TV, you have to be in by a certain time, whatever. Guess what she did? She FaceTimed me, and her and I watched the Royals win the World Series together. And I'd say, Nicole, do you want some chips? Ha <laughs> ha. <And>, um, <laughs> but there's this, there's this intimacy that's there that no matter how far we are apart, that we're still together. And that's the beauty of being a child. Ephesians 2 verse 17 says he came and, oh, I already preached that. Let's go on. It says, I love the way that Jesus talked to the Father. I told you that Abba only shows up in Scripture three times. One of the times was in Jesus when he was talking to the Father in the garden. The darkest, one of the darkest days in Jesus' life. We see the intimacy level that Jesus had with the Father. Look what it says in Mark 14. It says, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Uh, but take this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You guys know this story, right? Don't have time to preach it today. I usually preach this as a series. But I want you to catch that because Jesus knew the Father as Abba. He knew him at that level. And in his darkest hour, he reached out to the Father in his humanity. And he reached out to the Father and said, Daddy. Daddy, I need you right now. And you know, when we were adopted into the family of God, we inherited the opportunity to have that kind of access to our Heavenly Father. But we've got to see it that way, and we've got to run to Him. We're called to have that kind of relationship with Him. So the question is, have we received that, and are we attached to Him? You know, when we first got our kids, one of the things that they teach you when you're an adoptive parent is, is you've got to cocoon for a while and, and you've got to get those kids attached to you. And just as literally within a few months when we got up and running and moving on and going to the park and summer came, one of the things that would happen was that he would really without any second thought just wander off with anyone. Because his whole life he'd never been attached to anyone. And so they tell adoptive parents, like, you're going to have to keep your eye on your kids even much. Most kids, when they're born into your, they're going to, if, if a stranger comes, what do they do? Boom, they come right to your leg, right? They hide behind you. If there's a danger situation, well, our adoptive kids, they'll go the other way. They'll go where the candy is or the dog or the playground or that colorful balloon. I mean, they do, whatever it is, because they're not attached. 
But when we're attached to our family, to our parents, then that's who we run to in times of need. And as the children of God, we have to be so attached to him that when things go wrong, even when we fail, instead of running from him, we run to him. Amen? Okay, I got to go faster or we'll never get there. Adoption means? Okay, look at verse 16. Oh, I got to go quicker. Um, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Last thing I'll give you tonight is this, is that the adopted have confidence as his kids. You know, there's nothing more exciting to me now. <laughs> I told you about the 48 goals that my son scored. Do you know what he does every time he scores a goal? I'm not even exaggerating. Every time he scores a goal, he turns and almost in Forrest Gump fashion runs and looks at me and smiles. I mean, immediately. I mean, it's, just, it's there. Why? Because there's an attachment that's there. There's a connection that's there. He's like, Daddy, did you see that? Did you see I, I scored? Did you see I'm faster than everyone? <laughs> There's an attachment that's there. And you know what? That's how we ought to be with the Father as well. I talked about the legal documents, but the, and then I talk about the family. It's so important that we get both, you guys, that we understand. Man, there's more I wanted to talk about today. I, I, don't, I, I can't go much further, but I want to give you this real quickly. I'm, I, I want to... Can you tell I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do? Okay. Talk amongst yourselves. Anyway, um, don't do that. I'm just kidding. Lord. Okay, I'm going to tell you this. I'm just going to tell it to you for a moment. I'm not going to tell the whole story. I have to get to the point really quick. But I began to receive an orphan spirit when I was five years old. I have this vivid memory in my mind. Just before my dad went off to prison for the, or jail for the first time, uh, we lived in California at the time. My dad was involved with organized crime. He was anti-establishment hippie, but he was also pushing drugs. And, and, and my mom was just this beautiful young lady, and she was so innocent to so much of it. But she was, I mean, I was born in 69, if that tells you anything. So, I mean, she was a hippie. And I was raised around this whole hippie culture. And, but my dad came home, and he was obviously just full of stress and all this. And I'll never forget this as long as I live because I was supposed to be in bed, but I heard them fighting in the kitchen. And so I kind of snuck out. And, of course, I'm the only child. And I snuck out, and, and, um, and I'm, I'm watching. And my dad and, and my mom, they don't know that I'm seeing this, but they're fighting. And, uh, and my mom's, like, laying the law down and this and that. And she'd found out that he'd been unfaithful, and she'd found out that this and that and the other thing. And, and so there was a lot of fighting going on. I don't remember the details, but what I do remember is it got very physical. And my dad began to beat my mom. And I was standing there in my PJs, this little kid. And every, listen, everything in me wanted to defend her. But fear, just, I was like a deer in the head. I just froze. And I did nothing. I did nothing. And then he left. And then she went to her room, and no one even knew that I saw it. And I didn't realize until years later, when God was dealing with me, that on that night I began to receive an orphan spirit. As a matter of fact, here's what happened. God was dealing with me, and I, I, I can't get into all the details, but I, I want to give you the headlines, and this is so key for me and my journey. The Lord spoke to me, and he said, you need to forgive yourself. And I was like, well, forgive myself of What? And he said, you need to forgive yourself for not being able to defend her. You see, from that day all the way into my adult life, I always tried to play the hero. I was gotten fights. I was violent. I, I had all these. And, and, and what I realized was that it, it traced back to this wound that I didn't have what it took. And so the rest of my life, I was trying to prove that I did. And the adopted, listen, they don't have anything to prove. They don't have to earn anything. It's been paid for. And so we've got to come to the reality, you guys, that we can't earn his love. He just loves us. Scripture says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And we typically see that and we think of it in the context of conversion. And it obviously is. But repentance in its essence, at its root, is it means a change of heart and a change of direction. 
the kindness of God, the fact that God loves us no matter what, it, when we really get it and we embrace it, listen to what it does. It changes our mindset, and that changes our direction. Do you guys catch that? And then we're able to walk in the freedom that we're called to walk in. And so I, I don't have time to go into the rest of my notes. I have too, way too much there, but I want to talk to you personally today. I want to ask you today, have you received your adoption into his family. As a matter of fact, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. and I want to talk to you. Don't, don't shift on me. Just stick with me for a moment as they come up. And what I want to talk to you about specifically, I want you to hear this. Whether your testimony is like mine, and you didn't grow up in church, and didn't grow up knowing the Lord, and, 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 and you need to know him maybe for the first time, or maybe you know a lot about God. Maybe you have a relationship. Maybe you've been in very religious environments, and yet you find yourself living like an orphan. Because you haven't received that adoption. You haven't received that new identity. And it's hard for us to quantify that because we think in, in legal terms and we think and it's not about the law. It's not about what Jesus paid to, to deliver us from the repercussions of our sin. It's that he did that so that we could be his kids. And that we could enjoy all the blessings that come with being in his house and, and, and being with him. And so the, the telltale signs of a, of, a, of a child that's been adopted legally but hasn't embraced the relational side is that they don't run to the father when they're hurt. They don't run to the father when they don't measure up. They shy away in shame and shame. And religion will produce that. But when we've really embraced our adoption, we run to him all the time. We run to him in good times. We run to him in bad times. We run to him when we're confused. We run to him when we're confident. Why? Because, because we're his. And so what I'm going to invite the worship team to do is they're going to lead us in a song. And we're going to close this way. Pastor Kurt's going to come up at the end. But as we, lead, as we worship in this song, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Have I fully embraced my adoption? Or there are areas of my life where I operate out of an orphan spirit. And let the Holy Spirit do his work. Let the Holy Spirit speak. Let's just see what the Holy Spirit wants to do. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and just do that. I'm going to step off. Father, I thank you today. God, I thank you that you love us too much to leave us the way that we are. that you see where we are. We're not a mystery to you. Sometimes you're a mystery to us, but you know us completely and you love us unconditionally. And that combustible combination can change our lives if we'll receive you, if we'll embrace the reality that you are a loving father we can be your kids and we can enjoy all the benefits that come from that. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you'd speak now in Jesus' name.